Sutra. Ananda already knew that the Chattagata, the world honored one, had admonished Saputi and great Kashyapa for being a heart whose hearts were not fair and equal, and he regarded with respect the Chattagata's instructions on impartiality to save everyone from doubt and slander. Commentary Why did Ananda want to practice equality? and compassion in receiving offerings. Earlier, he had heard Shakyamuni Buddha admonish Saputi and Mahakashyapa and call them Ahats, meaning Ahats of the small vehicle, not great Ahats of the great vehicle. Why did he do that? It was Saputi's opinion that he should seek alms exclusively from the rich. Rich people should plant more blessings, he said. If he continue to do good deeds, then in their future lives, they will continue to be wealthy. If they don't give now, they won't be rich in the next life. In order to help the rich, I seek alms from them. Saputi's method was an example of avoiding the poor and favoring the rich. In complete contrast to him, Mahakashyapa sought alms exclusively from the poor. He thought, Poor people should plant blessings and do good deeds so that in their future lives they can be wealthy and honored. If I don't help them out by receiving alms from them, then in the next life and on into the future, they will continue to be poor, and so they were both small ahas. I believe there was another reason underlying their behavior. It seems fairly certain that Saputi liked to eat good food and great kashrapa foremost among the disciples in his practice of asceticism, ate what others couldn't eat, endured what others couldn't endure, bore what others couldn't bear, and yielded where others couldn't yield. Evidently, he was unconcerned about what kind of food he ate, so he sought arms from the poor and gave them the opportunity to plant blessings. The gifts of food and drink offered by poor people are never as fine as those given by the wealthy. The food the rich throw out on the streets is bound to be better than the offerings of the poor. Shakyamuni Buddha knew that these two disciples did not practice equality and compassion in their arms aroused. He was aware of the discriminations they made, and so the Tathagata, the world honored one, had admonished Saputi and Great Kashyapa for being a heart whose hearts were not fair and equal. Ananda regarded with respect the Tathagata's instructions on impartiality to save everyone from doubt and slander. He was extremely respectful of this Dharma door of equality, which advised against choosing among donors. Minds that make such discriminations do not belong to the great Rehaiko Dharma but to selfish people. Remembering the reprimand Saputi and great Kashyapa had received from Shakyamuni Buddha, Ananda did not want to imitate them, and so he carefully practiced equality and compassion. Shakyamuni Buddha's Dhamma door was a wide open expedient free of the slightest obstruction, devoid of any limitation. If one begs exclusively from the rich or from the poor, one can easily arouse people's doubts and cause them to slander the Dhamma. Collecting arms impartially makes everyone's doubts and slander melt away and disappeared altogether. Everyone can happily plant blessings and have his wishes fulfilled. Sutra, having crossed the city moat, he walked slowly through the outer gates, his manner stern and, Im and proper as he honored with propriety the method of obtaining food. Commentary, Shravasti was surrounded by a moat just like those found around some ancient cities in China. Water was kept in the moat at all times to form a protection for the city. Once Ananda had crossed the moat, he arrived within the confines of the great city 
of Shravasti. Having crossed the city moat, he walked slowly through the outer gate, his manner stern and proper, as he strictly respected the rules for obtaining vegetarian food. Ananda was dignified, with eyes straight ahead, and at the same time extremely respectful. In this way, he slowly passed through the outer gates of the city. He exhibited an awesome manner and model department. He didn't look at improper spectacles, nor did he even drop. All the time that he held his bow, he displayed the utmost propriety, propriety and respect for the drama of receiving, not daring to be the least bit casual or lax as he traveled through the streets. Sutra at that time, because Ananda was begging in sequential order, he passed by a house of prostitution and was waylaid by a powerful artifice. By means of a mantra of the Kapila religion, formerly of the Brahma heaven, the daughter of Mataji drew him onto an impure mat. Commentary At that time, Ananda was being stern and proper, honoring with propriety the method for obtaining food. Because Ananda was begging in sequential order, by going door to door, house to house, he passed by a house of prostitution and was awaited by a, a powerful artifice. It was not real, but was something conjured up. The daughter of Mantaji had urged her mother to make use of a mantra, which allegedly had come from the gods of the Brahma heaven and had being brought down to the human realm. But it was phony, it was empty and false, so it is called an artifice. Mantaji is a Sanskrit name interpreted to mean vulgar lineage, indicate that she was not honorable. Her daughter's name was Prakriti, which is Sanskrit for basic nature. Ananda was not snared by a mantra of the Kapila religion, formerly of the Brahma heaven. Mantanji had learned her false mantra from members of the stony head religion. In fact, the Manchik divide was falsely named because it was not really a transmission from the Brahma heaven. Its proponents just claimed it was, and in that way got people to believe in them. However, the recitation of the mantra was able to turn Ananda's spirit and soul upside down, and he fell into a stupor as if asleep, dreaming or drunk. Without realizing what was happening, he went into the house of prostitution. The mantra which came from the Brahma heaven had rendered him totally oblivious and had totally confused his self-nature. Basically, Ananda was a sage who had been certified as having attained the first fruition. Then why was the mantra purported to have come from the Brahma heaven able to confuse him, you wonder? He became confused because he had concentrated on studying the sutras and had not been attentive to samadhi power. And so, although he had attained the first fruition, his samadhi power was still insufficient. Therefore, when he encountered this kind of demon, he was confused by her, and the daughter of Mantaji drew him onto a, an impure mat. Ananda was extremely handsome. His features were almost as perfect as the 32 fine marks of the Buddha. Ananda's skin was snowy white and glistened like silver, sparkled like frost. Most Indians had dark complexions, but Ananda's skin was extremely soft, supple, smooth, and especially fair. That is why Mantanji's daughter was infatuated with Ananda the moment she laid eyes on him and went running to tell her mother that she wanted Ananda. He is a disciple of the Buddha, her mother said. How can you want him? He is a big shrew and cannot marry. You can't have him. 
That doesn't make any difference to me, replied her daughter. Mother, you're going to have to think of a way to trap Ananda for me. If I can't marry Ananda, I won't go on living, she said obstinately. Her desire was so overpowering that it was a matter of life and death. Ah, thought Mataji, she loves him so much. I have to think of a way to do what cannot be done. So she used the mantra, a Devon Dharma from the Kambila religion, and recited until Ananda became hypnotized. He followed her in a days like a drunken beggar in such a stupor that he couldn't tell east from west, north from south. He went right into the house and followed Mantanji's daughter into her room and onto the bed. Sutra with a licentious body, she stroked and rubbed him until he was on the verge of destroying the preset substance. Commentary This was a dangerous spot to be in. With her licentious body, she caressed him until he was on the verge of destroying the preset substance. He still hadn't broken it. This is an important point. When one receives the precepts, one becomes endowed with a certain substance, which, if destroyed, is as serious as if your very life had been cut off. It is extremely important for people who have left their home life not to break precepts. If precepts are broken, you might just as well die. As for Ananda, if the text said that his precept substance was already destroyed, it would mean it would be all over for him. Ananda would have fallen, and in the future he would have had a great deal of difficulty in cultivating successfully. Why did Mantanji's daughter have such a compelling attraction for Ananda? It stemmed from the fact that Ananda and Mantanji's daughter had been married to one another in 500 former lives. Because they had been a married couple, so in so many former lives. As soon as she saw Ananda this time, her old habits took over and she fell madly in love with him. Ananda had been her husband before and she was determined to have him for her husband again. Because those days passed down life after life, she was now willing to sacrifice everything, even her very life, for the sake of her love for Ananda. Sutra The Tathagata, knowing Ananda was being taken advantage of by the incident artifice, finished the meal and immediately began his return journey. The king, great officials, elders, and lay pupils followed along after the Buddha, desiring to hear the essentials of Dharma. Commentary Whenever the Buddha accepted an offering, he always spoke the Dharma after the meal for the sake of the vegetarian host. Only after speaking the Dharma would he return to the subland abode of the Jetta Grove. But this time, there were special circumstances. The Tathagata, knowing Ananda was being taken advantage of by the incident, uh, indecent artifice, finished the meal and immediately began his return journey. Knowing that Ananda had met with difficulty and was on the verge of destroying the precept substance, the Buddha ate quickly and as soon as he finished, he immediately returned to the sublime abode of the Chatter Grove. In fact, I imagine he did not eat very much since his beloved disciple and cousin and personal attendant was in trouble. The Buddha thought, Ah, my attendant is being violated by demons. He's been captured by demons. How can this be? The king, great officials, elders, and lay people followed along after the Buddha, desiring to hear the essentials of the drama. Everyone knew that there was some important reason why the Buddha had not spoken drama for the vegetarian host after the meal. They thought that the reason for the hasty retreat 
would suddenly be announced, so everyone, the king, the officials, the elders, and the lay pupil followed the Buddha back to the sublime abode of the Chetan Grove. Why? Everyone had forgotten everything else but the single-minded desire to understand whatever important principle of drama was about to be spoken. They didn't know what had come up that was so unusual. Everyone was anxious to hear what the Buddha would say. Sutra. Then the wound honored one emitted a hundred rays of joy and fearless light from his crown. Within the light appeared a thousand petaled precious lotus, which, upon which was seated a transformation body Buddha in full lotus posture, proclaiming a spiritual mantra. Commentary Shakyamuni Buddha, the world honored one, emitted a hundred rays of joy and filled his light from his crown. The hundreds of rays can represent the hundred realms within the light appeared a thousand petaled jeweled precious lotus, which can represent the thousand such nieces. These meanings can be investigated gradually. Now it is enough to understand the passage in general. From his crown, the crown of his head were emitted a hundred rays of jeweled light, and from this light radiated Phyllis lights. The rays of Phyllis lights showed possession of a great awesome virtue. Fearing nothing, they were able to subdue all heavenly demons and externalists. No mantra whatever could withstand with uh, withstand them. Not even one purported to have come from the Brahma heaven. The hundred rays of jeweled light also brought forth a thousand petaled jeweled lotus, which, upon which was seated a transformation body Buddha in full lotus posture. In full lotus posture, you sit with your legs crossed over one another, your feet resting on the tops of opposite thighs. There is a great deal of merit and virtue involved in sitting in four lotus. His transformation body, Buddha, was proclaiming a spiritual mantra. He pronounced the Suragama mantra for Shakyamuni Buddha to have a transformation body, Buddha speak. The mantra represents the secret cause within the secret cause, the king of kings of mantras. The Suraga Mantra, Surangama Mantra is extremely important. If you who study the Buddha Dharma can learn the Suragama Mantra in this life, you will not have been a human being in vain. If you do not learn the Suragama Mantra, it will be like climbing a mountain made of the seven jewels gold, silver, crystal, lapis lazuli. Mother of pearl, red pearl, and carnelian, and coming back down empty handed. You arrive at the top of the mountain and you think about picking up some gold or perhaps some pearls, but then wonder if you should take silver instead. In the end, you can't decide which ones it would be best to take, and so you come anyway without any at all. So you come away without any at all. That is the situation of people who can't memorize the Suragama Mantra. So I hope that everyone will at the very least study hard enough so that they are able to recite it from memory. Not to speak of several weeks effort, it is worth several years effort if needed. It is extremely valuable. And this opportunity you have now to encounter it is extremely rare, very hard to come by. Very hard to come by. It is the unsurpassed, profound, subtle, wonderful drama. There is nothing higher, nothing deeper. The Buddha used the Suragama Mantra to save Ananda, who had already attained the first version of Ahashi. Now, if you ordinary people do not rely on the Suragama Mantra, how can you end birth and death? Birth and death. Therefore, each of you should resolve to take my advice in this. I will tell you a story that will illustrate the merit of sitting in full lotus posture. Once there was a bhikshu who did not cultivate. 
but concentrated instead on reciting sutras and repentances for the dead for money. Whenever someone died, he would accept the request to take the deceased across the sea of suffering by reciting sutras by performing repentances. One day he was returning to the monastery after having spent the day reciting sutras for the deceased. He paused the house with a dog in the yard. The dog began to bark at him, and he overheard the wife inside the house say to her husband, Go see who it is. Then the bishop saw the husband peer out of the slit in the curtain and reply, Oh, we just that ghost who peddles sutras and repentances. He passed on by, but the words echoed his ears in his ears. Why had that man called him a ghost who peddles sutras and repentances? Why hadn't he called him a Buddha who peddles sutras and repentances? Or an immortal sage who peddles sutras and repentances? As he continued on his way to the monastery, it suddenly began to rain and he took shelter under a bridge. I guess I'd sit in meditation, he thought, and he pulled up his legs in full lotus posture. After he had sat for a while, two ghosts came by. When they reached the spot where he was sitting, they suddenly stopped and one said to the other, there's a golden pagoda. Hurry up, let's start, uh, let's start bowing. The Sharira relics of the Buddha are kept in golden pagodas. If we bow to the Buddha's relics, our offenses will soon disappear. With that, the two began to bow. After they had bowed for a while, the letter of the ghost who peddles sutras and repentances started to hurt and in order to be more comfortable he released the full lotus posture into half lotus that is with the leg left leg above the right leg beneath and the left foot with resting on the right thigh the next time the two ghosts came up from above they noticed something strange hey said one of the other that golden pagoda just turned into a silver pagoda. Do you see that? So what? said the other. Silver pagodas are still something special. We should keep bowing. So the two of them kept bowing. They bowed for about half an hour or an hour. Or maybe it was only a few minutes. There was no clock, so there's no way to know. Soon enough, the bishop's legs hurt again. He unfolded them and lazily stretched them out just like some people do when they are tired of sitting in meditation. I think I'd lie down, he thought. But just then, the two bowing ghosts caught a glimpse of their pagoda turning into a pile of mud. Hey, look at that! One cried, quick, let's clobber it. Realizing the ghosts were about to beat him up, the bishop froze in fear and slipped neatly back into a full lotus just in the nick of time. Oh, the two ghosts cried in unison. It does have the Buddha's relics in it. It's going through all kinds of weird changes. One minute is a golden pagoda, the next a silver pagoda, and then it turns into mud. We better just keep bowing no matter what happens next. And then they continued non-stop until dawn. The incident had a lasting effect on the ghost who peddled sutras and repentances. He sat there thinking, if I sit in full lotus, there is a golden Buddha, golden pagoda. If I sit in half lotus, there is a silver pagoda. And if I don't sit at all, there's nothing but a pile of mud. I had better start to cultivate, to stop peddling sutras and repentances. He buried himself in the task at hand and worked diligently at his cultivation. After he had cultivated, he eventually became enlightened and was given the name Dhyana Master Kwei B, pressured, pressured by ghosts. Because if it hadn't been for those, who, those two ghosts who were threatening him, threatening to beat him up, he might have continued to 
procrastinate and never gotten around to cultivating.